Thank you, Colin and Heather, all the way from Hobart. It's nice to see some of those faces that um, pop up on our live stream, isn't it? So thank you, Heather, for joining us. Well, if you turn with me to Daniel chapter 5, we'll continue in our exile service, uh, series. Let's um, pray. Father, as we come to explore your word again this morning, we pray that you will give us open hearts and open minds, a willing spirit to receive the word that you have for us today. Amen. Well, we are in week eight of our exile series as we journey through the book of Daniel. What have we learnt so far? Well, God doesn't want us to isolate from the prevailing, prevailing, prevailing culture that we live in. He, and he certainly doesn't want us to integrate with it. What God wants is for us to permeate our society, making it a better place just because of our presence within it. And he wants us to intentionally grow the kingdom of God from within. God hates pride. We've learned that. But he's also slow to anger and full of mercy. We've learned that Babylon, her rulers and her people are, are falsely polytheistic and the towards the God of Israel. Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego have faithfully and unswervingly served God since their exile into Babylon. We've learned that God is faithful, consistently vindicating those who stand firm in his promises. We've learned that he answers faithful prayer and that he performs miracles. We've been hurtling along at a breakneck speed through the first 40 odd years of Israel's exile in Babylon. There's been twists and turns which would make any roller coaster developer salivate. Then we come to chapter 5 and we're thrown away some 25 years forward into the future to the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar, who he's only the regent. And we won't go into that, but he is ruling Babylon at this time. Now, by now, King Nebuchadnezzar is dead. Daniel would be 80 odd years old, and he served under, I think it's four or six uh, Babylonian kings for some 67 ish years. And now he is once again called to stand in the gap, demonstrating the inadequacy of human wisdom and the ultimate. Sovereignty of God. Now last week when we left off, we left off with the statement that only God is great. I love that. Today we're going to look at human defiance, writing on the wall, and humility, hope and obedience, or H2O for short. Okay, so here's a quick quiz for you. Which everyday frame come direct from the Bible. Can you think of some? How about an eye for an eye? A tooth from a tooth for a tooth. It comes from Exodus chapter 12, 21. What about by the skin of my teeth? Job 19. By the sweat of my brow? It comes from Genesis 3. What about going the extra mile? Matthew 5. Math certainly goes the extra mile, doesn't it? How about a little bird told me? Matthew 16. But out of the mouths of babes. It comes from Psalm 8. Rise and shine. Anybody get that one as a child? It's Isaiah 60. Have you ever heard of a scapegoat? It comes from Leviticus 16. Or in the twinkling of an eye. It comes from 1 Corinthians 15. And then there was the one that we're going to look at today. The writing on the wall, or the writing was on the wall, or the writing is on the wall. It's said in a few days, isn't it? But that comes directly out of Daniel chapter 5. At the beginning of this year, beginning of 2020, Australia experienced some of the most ferocious fires in living memory, with almost every state bursting into flame over what seemed to be months. Close to 1,000 homes were lost. 186 square kilometres burnt and some 34 lives lost. 
Towns were decimated. The fire was so hot in places that it melted vehicles and created its own weather patterns. The smoke was so dense that at times it precluded the sun and turned day into night and an eerie orange hue was the only light that people could see by. As we watched on at the, the impending catastrophe hurtling towards people, it was overwhelming. And it was so overwhelming that some people prophesied that God was giving us a warning. Others that God's judgment was, was on us. as And still others that is, it, it signified the beginning of the end. There was even one journalist who quipped that it was the writing on the wall for Australia. The thing is that bushfires happen all the time in Australia. And this wasn't even the worst bushfire on record. Yet there were stories of prayer groups on the foreshores and in shelters and of professed atheists falling on their knees and calling on God to save them. It mostly didn't lead to lasting change, but in a moment of crisis, every day Aussies were on their knees in repentance and faith. And fair enough too, because fires are terrifying, but they're not all that rare. However, a detached hand appearing in a room and writing stuff on the wall, that's something which doesn't happen every day. So what sort of outcome, what kind of response would you expect to hear from those who witnessed it? Babylon was a wealthy kingdom. The city was considered impenetrable from the outside. In the days of Belshazzar, Babylon was under attack. But Belshazzar was that Babylon would not fall, could not fall to his enemies. His army was too mighty. His walls were too imposing. In fact, Belshazzar was so convinced that there was no power which could stand against his nation's might that instead of leading a prayer vigil, as they did in Malakuta a few months back, Belshazzar throws a party. The alcohol is flowing and the bravado is growing. And as if to prove his valour, in verses 2 to 4, he calls for the golden vessels that have been taken out of the house of God in Jerusalem so that the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines could drink from them. And they did drink from them. And they praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. Notice that the king was holding a feast to honour the gods of silver, bronze, iron, wood and stone, but he didn't take their goblets to party with, did he? No. Instead, he deliberately calls for the vessels of gold and silver that came from the temple in Jerusalem. Now, why would he do that? Well, apparently he did it deliberately. In verses 18 to 22, that, that, down a little further, Daniel tells us what's going on. He says, in short, this is my paraphrase, that Belshazzar had deliberately mocked the God of Israel because he was ashamed of his grandfather, King Nebuchadnezzar. Ashamed. Belshazzar knew all the stories of how God had acted in Babylon. He knew how Nebuchadnezzar had been brought low by the God of Israel. How, how Nebuchadnezzar had humbled himself before God and found a saving faith. And instead of learning from this, he was embarrassed by it. And now faced with the threats, with threats on all sides, Belshazzar makes an open declaration that not only does he reject the threat of the Medes and the Persians, but also he rejects the supposed power of the God of Israel. Wow. In his mind, Belshazzar is going to prove 
Babylon is too strong to be conquered by some foreign king and that he himself is too powerful to be intimidated by some foreign god. Regardless of what he knew from history, he was defiant. He basically doesn't want to bow down to a God that says he has to change his attitude and his lifestyle. He wants nothing to do with a God who says be humble rather than proud, considerate rather than selfish. You know, that's why a lot of people still reject God today. They know what the Bible says. The gospel has been clearly explained, but they don't want to change their attitude and their lifestyle. We tinker around the outsides a little bit. Sure, that, that's fine. We can tinker. But not a total transformation of heart, mind and action. George Orwell once observed, on the, whole human, on, on the whole, human beings want to be good, but not too good and not quite all the time. It's true, isn't it? We've all been there to some degree and some of us are still there, relying on our own strength, on our own prosperity, our looks, our skills, our education, our family name, holding onto something that one guilty little pleasure that we'd rather not relinquish, hoping that God won't notice. But he does. And we all know people who stand behind in that space still today. They don't want to change. They want God to stay over there somewhere. They don't want his morality or his rules. It's inconvenient and at best... You know, it's difficult. At worst, it's embarrassing. Really, it's much easier to worship in their minds the gods, little g, of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, because they appear to demand nothing from us. But in the end, they will leave us with nothing. So here we are. The party is in full swing. And out of nowhere, a disembodied hand appears and starts writing on the wall. That would have been a bit disconcerting, don't you think? And I reckon it would have sobered our king up pretty quickly. Verse 6, he became deathly pale. His thoughts terrified him and his lower body lost all strength. Where does one turn? Where do we turn? In moments such as this. As Christians we say in unison, God, we turn to God. But Belshazzar is a polytheistic pagan. So he's astrologers, Facebook University and Oprah. And yet again we see secular wisdom fail. They can't read it. They can't interpret it. And there was quite a ruckus going on. So, uh, and so in verse 10, the queen's mother enters and she remembers Daniel. So old Daniel is summoned. And in true Daniel style, he rejects the, the, the payment uh, of, of, uh, of anything but, but prestige and power. He, he refuses payment in, for favourable interpretation. He may not be in power anymore, but Daniel is still a man of God. He stands and he speaks God's message of truth. He says, verse 24 to 25, Then from God's presence the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed. And this is, is the writing that was inscribed. Many, many tekel parson. And this is what the interpret, interpretation of the matter. Many... God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Parson, your kingdom is divided and will be given to the Medes and the Persians. Now I'm not going to go into great detail on what these words meant. 
All we need to know is that Belshazzar rejected God and, and the message that God was sending. God's message. The judgment day has come. Belshazzar has been weighed in the balance and found him. His kingdom is to be brought to an end and given to the Medes and the Persians. Friends, if judgment came today and God were writing on your wall, what would he write? What would he write on mine? Would he write, well done, good and faithful servant? Or would we see similar words to those that Belshazzar saw? How would we respond? Before interpreting the words, Daniel gives Belshazzar a history lesson and basically accuses the king of being dense. Verse 20, you have not humbled your heart even though you knew what happened to your grandfather. You see, Belshazzar's problem isn't ignorance. It's insolence and arrogance. And these are traits endemic in our society today. So there's an important lesson for us here. And it flies in the face of what our Western culture would have us, have us know. Having clear information does not guarantee the right response. Let's face it. We often lament only people knew what happens if they don't wear a seatbelt. If only young people knew the damage that drugs and alcohol cause. If only people really understood how, just how infectious COVID-19 is and how rapidly it spreads and the devastating consequences of infection. If only. If only. But this is Daniel's point. Belshazzar knew and it didn't matter. Did you know that JFK's older brother, Joe, was a bomber pilot in World War II? He flew the Liberator class plane, which was designed to um, be loaded with explosives and then after takeoff, it would be directed to his target via remote control after the pilot and co-pilot had bailed out. Before their departure, on the 12th of August, 1944, Joe was warned a detonator in this particular plane was faulty, which meant that anything could set it off at any time, and even before they'd bailed out. Joe was urged to abort the mission, but he ignored the warning and he did it anyway. The plane blew up. Kennedy and his co pilot died. He knew, he was told, but it made no difference. Belshazzar knew the work of God and the power of God, but he trusted in his own prosperity. And Daniel says in verse 23 that he set himself against the Lord of heaven. We know the word of God the works of God and the power of God. He makes it clear that he desires that none should be lost. So desperate is he that we should turn to him that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The gospel is clear. But the choice of how to respond to this truth and his grace is still ours to make. We have to choose. We have to ask him to transform us. So we respond with our H2O, hope, humility and obedience. Otherwise we'll be setting ourselves up against God. C.S. Lewis writes, there are two kinds of people in this world. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, all right then, have it your way.
that want to be in the second group. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the message of Daniel chapter 5. We give thanks for your grace and your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray for the non-Christians in our lives, that your word will become real to them, that they will be humbled before you in order that they can experience the full measure of your grace and redemption. Lord, we pray for all those who haven't fully given their lives to you. Lord, soften their hearts. Lead them into a full and saving relationship with you. And Lord, we pray that you will help us all to continue to walk with you in humility, that we would continue to lead others to know you by sharing our lived experience of your grace and mercy in our lives. Lord, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Transform us all into the likeness of your Son, through him who alone deserves all praise, honour and glory. Amen.